interesting. I, I just want to speak up for, for BC here for a minute. We, we on the telecommunication side, a gentleman by the name of Richard Gavinkel, who was a, a lobbyist and activist on the telecommunications side, did pressure the CRTC to get public interveners' costs with a, a, a very complex matters to do with the change of rates and local telephone and so on, subsidizing citizens' groups for uh, appearance before the commission, the CRTC, on telecommunications hearings. Uh, with the advent of competition, that amount uh, available to public interest groups has declined. But unfortunately, despite repeated efforts at placing legislation to extend that law to the broadcast side, to enable certain citizens groups to take action, in particular, uh, the, uh, the uh, community, uh, excellent community channel, uh, downtown on Hastings, which is the cable channel, which has the longest history of community broadcasting, despite their petition to the CRTC for support to attend a hearing on community broadcasting, of course, they received no support. So legislatively, there are minor things that can be done on the broadcast side that I think go a long way to enabling at least equal time before the commissioner on public interest issues. I'd just like to, to, to add to that, but one of the 97 recommendations of the Lincoln Report was to provide uh, public intervener costs on the broadcasting side. And in the government's response, they actually acknowledged that proposal and said, uh, we're not going to accept this at this point. We've chosen to invest in Canadian production instead. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff, you I have a, um, there's always a question in my mind that there's a, there's a divide, and the divide five years ago was between people that had internet access and people that gained information from mass media. But today, considering that the 18 to 34 year old demographic gets most of their information online as opposed to newspapers or television, in fact, that's a, a catastrophe today. They don't know how to get young people back. They're never going to get them back. There's a, just a new way of doing things. So are we applying are we trying to apply a solution to an old business model that's slowly going to die away? Is, is this whole conversation this evening, is it moot? In five years, will young people say, we could care less about newspapers. We don't read them now, we're not going to read them in five years. And we're at that point, we're going to be 30 years old. We're going to control a lot of the market and the economy. Uh, we don't watch television as much as we use the internet. We do all our research online, so where is this really going? Regulation, how can you control and regulate peer-to-peer? -peer? Really Very difficult. Well, this is why I, I insist on including internet regulation issues in the, in the discussion. And, and certainly, it, it's, um, these are early days with regard to the internet. We don't really know how it's going to, how, how it's going to um, shape up. And that's why all of the big media organizations are scrambling to get on the internet. I mean, you know, and, and, and some of the, the most visited sites, certainly in the area of information, are sites that are operated by huge mainstream media companies, the, the, the BBC or the New York Times or the Globe and Mail. Uh, so we have, to, we have to take a holistic approach to this. Certainly, I don't think it, it makes any sense nowadays to talk about uh, to talk about newspaper ownership or uh, television regulation without also considering uh, the impact of digitalization, new new technologies, and, and, and so on. So I mean, we have to have the discussion has to extend to to include that. Hi, Kate Milbury. I'm a doctor student communication. And just following up on that question, you mentioned earlier um, the fact that internet regulation and it sounded like it had some concerns and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on your thoughts about the potential um, for internet regulation and problems with benefits that you foresee as you mentioned it's so new and it's still all important it's almost impossible to find but it sounded like you had concerns yeah um, I think that there, there are there's a huge array of issues with regard to the internet that, that are being uh, that are not being dealt with in a coherent uh, regulatory fashion, but where there are uh, uh, real regulatory impact that, um, 
is uh, taking place either uh, um, outside of, of uh, either in completely untransparently. I mean, in terms of in, in, in terms of what uh, intelligence services are setting up and collaborating uh, internationally and so on, in the name of the war on terrorism, obviously, um, and which are uh, raising privacy issues. That's one set of issues. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, cultural diversity issues, multilingualism on the internet, I mean, the way the way the physical uh, architecture and infrastructure of the internet is geared towards certain forms of cultural expression at the exclusion of others is uh, a tremendously important uh, area if we're talking about a global medium, and something that should be inclusive of all of those people and cultures and so on. So a lot of these issues are just, we're just beginning to, to identify them. And others are actually being um, worked on in places like the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is dealing with intellectual property rights and, and extending intellectual property rights regimes uh, to um, um, digitalization and particularly internet communication. And I'll, again, all of this is being done, or most of it is being done, without any kind of democratic public imp um, input. Um, so uh, there's a whole a whole array. I mean, I would recommend to you the uh, the report of the working group on internet governance, very easily accessible, wgig.org, um, which has identified about 25 issue areas and and ways in which uh, they're going to uh, those, those issues are going to have to be dealt with internationally and globally in the next five years. Okay. My name is Elsie Jang, and this is with respect to the CRTC. You mentioned very briefly uh, in both smarter regulations, and I know that the the uh, the breadth, you know, that the, their policies have a huge impact. For example, possibly 20 years or more ago, when they decreed that on the radio there should be more Canadian content. I think that this probably gave rise to a lot of Canadian songwriters, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so what types of policy or regulations would you think are pertinent today that would have some, you know, impact in, uh, in down the road that could be or that would smart? It's a really excellent question. I don't know if I can do justice to it in a simple answer. Um, the CRTC has to do better at dealing with the old media that, that has, it has been dealing with up until now. You know, I mean, I, I'm amazed actually at how, I mean, I've always been critical of the CRTC, but when I look today at some of the things they did 10 and 15 years ago, it, I mean, it looks wonderful compared to what they're doing today. You know, I mean, the example I mentioned about the satellite radio decision is actually going to, it's going to undo um, the gains that were made uh, through uh, through radio content regulation in the uh, um, in the 80s and the 90s. So that's 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 one thing. That's one area. Um, the CRTC five years ago decided that it was not going to get involved in anything to do with the new media on the internet. It's absolutely ludicrous, given where um, uh, where communication is is going, and they've not revisited that decision. Uh, they could. They could. They, they, can, they can revisit it at, at, uh, at any time, but there hasn't been enough public pressure on them, and apparently there hasn't been industry pressure on them to do that. Industry is happy with the situation uh, the way it is, uh, except in very specific, uh, specific cases. I mean, now the um, uh, the newcomers in uh, in telephony pressured the CRTC into uh, I into announcing that it would regulate um, uh, telephone rates over IP. This is like years after saying we don't have to do anything with the internet. Now all of a sudden, because they're prodded a bit by by, by some of their clients, um, internet regulation is okay. So. There, there's a huge uh, amount of work that they could be doing, but one thing about the CRTC, I mentioned in my talk, um, governance with regard to the CBC and the way and the way board members are named, same same story with the CRTC. Yes. I mean, why couldn't we have a more open and transparent process for the naming of CRTC commissioners? I mean, Question up at the back. So for 
towards possibly the private sector, um, do you find that or feel that cell phone technologies might become more pertinent in developing nations where access and infrastructure costs are less with regards to commercialization? I don't really have expertise on that, um, but intuitively I would say yes, um, because I mean, basically, generally speaking, communication technologies don't just develop on their own. And um, if we want them as a society to develop in a way that is socially beneficial, there has to be some kind of oversight that takes the public interest into account. I mean, so that's that's a kind of an, uh, an overall attitude that I take uh, that, I, that I take towards all communication technologies. Do you have a supplementary to that, or um, more, I guess it was just my question is, I wonder why more research, or if research, if no research is going in that direction, because it seems the internet gets um, more closed off um, and more private interests take shape there. That cell phone technologies. As far as cost access is, is um, made possible for people for you know, $100 versus the amount of knowledge that you need to operate a cell phone and communicate on the cell phone as far as that. So I just wanted to know if research mm -hmm. is going in that direction or if you see it going in that direction. Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's not, it's not an area that I've looked into, but, but intuitively I would say yes. And uh, by the way, there's an interesting. Uh, media event that's going to take place at the World Summit uh, next week. Um, Nicholas Negroponte is floating a, a project for um, uh, to give a laptop to everybody. Uh, the hundred dollar laptop uh, <laughs> project and it's um, yeah it's it's one of the highly mediatized uh, a, a, um, events that is uh, going to be taking place there to de uh, detract uh, distract people from the political issues. Yeah. The BC, in defense of BC and the Freedom of Information and Privacy Association here in British Columbia has been quite repeatedly acknowledged as at the forefront of protecting access to information. The association here in BC was actually asked to interview stakeholders with respect to the internet and legislation and with a particular focus the Attorney General's office was interested in the whole war on terror and do we have enough security with respect to information. And uh, I'm going to speak out of school and, and, and say they weren't very pleased with what we had to say because when we interviewed the stakeholders, the attitude was that the, the, the government had all the access and security that they needed. I think it was, what, two weeks later that, uh, that the, uh, um, the Attorney General's on national television with all these police chiefs talking about how they've got to increase security. Is that a question? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what do you think about the war on terror and the internet? Well, I, I mean, I think it's being used as a, an excuse and an alibi to, 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 to just jack up uh, surveillance technologies and um, uh, legislation and, uh, and give government and intelligence services really uh, the, the, the rights to spy on us. It isn't even governments. I mean, it's it's the intelligence services which are which uh, have uh, established a, a a parallel force, and they work more closely together internationally than the governments do on these things. So, sure. I mean, I mentioned in in, in, in my talk the uh, legal access uh, legislation. Is that an, is that an issue uh, here? Um, is, is the, is lawful access. access. Sorry. Yes, yeah, it's a big issue right here. Yes. And, and uh, I think the worst part of it is the amount of technology that the internet service providers are going to have to create and put in a tremendous expense in order that police will be able to, to put surveillance on citizens. It's going to transform, I think, the relationship between ISPs and customers. It's going to be a different kind of thing. Okay, interesting. Why? Uh, sorry, why? Why? Yeah, how, how and why? Uh, why is it going to be a different relationship? Well, it's like if you, you create a welfare you know, a department to give uh, welfare benefits to citizens and it transmutes into a policing agency for who's getting the benefit. You know, it's the same kind of thing, the ISP, which exists to give us access and provide us a communication channel, then it becomes police. 
they're going to have to do the tackling. It won't be the police who do the tackling. Right. Yeah, basically, basically the, I mean, the law would oblige ISPs to do what, 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 what the radio stations do, for example, right now with regard to broadcast, which is to keep, keep logs for a certain period of time and, and make them accessible on demand to, um, to, to the authorities. But also provide the information about the communications that's taking place. Mm -hmm. This is Daryl Evans, by the way, Executive Director of the Freedom of Information Privacy Association. Oh, thank you. Recently sent by Gordon Gibson in the Globe Mail that nobody should get an order of Canada before him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Exactly. When we look at uh, traditional Canadian media, be it television, radio broadcasting, the telephone system in Canada, uh, really there's a, a, a good argument to be made that our infrastructure is quite backwards and that it represents a, an economic um, sort of a, a weight on us uh, that some other nations, for example, installing cellular infrastructures without the need for copper wires and things like that allow us to lean ahead with the traditional types of technologies. Canada has a regulatory and legislative framework for managing those technologies, but when we look at internet, it's, it's much broader. Television, you can have voice over IP. The telephone suddenly jumps the barrier. If you're uh, publishing on the internet, you can be using servers in Canada, the US, or somewhere else in the world quite transparently. Um, yet, we're, and, and there are many types of document or media formats. Um, yet, access to those formats, the production of media on those formats, is, is largely hindered by proprietary ownership of standards, protocols, applications, and so on and so forth. Um, other countries appear to be looking at those issues in, in, in a little clearer detail, making sure that our documentation, be the government, educational, personal, are accessible to everyone. What country do you have in mind? Uh, some of the South American countries, countries mm -hmm. like, uh, as well, uh, including countries like New Zealand, looking at specifying open formats in their government RFPs, uh, this type of thing. Uh, Canada appears to be failing on those counts. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have a .ca naming group here in Canada who's established a fairly high quality brand of validating the people that register their names. Where we appear also to be falling short is providing personal security in terms of our internet communications. And I'm, I'm wondering if you see a picture of legislation or regulation that addresses some of those issues. For example, traditional government privacy legislation puts our information in silos so we can't get at it without a great deal to spend some time. But I, as someone on the internet, would like to have assured, person-to-person, -person, validated communications, <coughs> privately encrypted communications, and able to conduct transactions on the same basis without having operating systems and so forth that are invaded by viruses and trojans and everything. Do you see any regulatory infrastructure coming into play that can help us to address those very serious issues? I'd step back one, one, one step. I mean, before you can even address the question of regulatory infrastructure, you have to ask, what is it you want to regulate? What is it? I raised that question. Is, is, it a, is it a commodity? Is it a force for developing industry? Or is it a public good? And we haven't had that debate in Canada, but we've made the decision without having the debate. I mean, internet development takes place under the auspices of Industry Canada. And if you read the, if you read the policy literature, it's very clear and very unproblematized by them. I mean, they're, they're talking about a system which um, is to be developed in the logic of promoting Canadian industry and the economy. Um, so, Well, that's what it is right now. But as I say, it's, it's without having had a public debate on this question. Um, and, and now, again, other countries have had uh, this debate. I mean, the, the Norway, for example, when they, when they intervene at the World Summit on the Inf Information Society, the first thing that they say is, the internet is a public good. Now, I've actually tried to suggest 
to uh, some of the people in Ottawa at Industry Canada that they work this into their discourse. And, you know, they're very polite about it, but it's, it's, it's a non-starter because they're not in the business of public good. They're in the business of developing industry and, and, uh, and, and economic development. So you have to go back even one step further. Right? I mean, we have to take internet development out of the hands of Industry Canada and put it in the hands of somebody else. Ooh, I'm going to respond. Okay, I had almost three simultaneous hands. 